Hey, good morning, everybody. Um, I have the pleasure to introduce our keynote speaker, Ambassador Alan Mustard. Um, I wanted to share how I was introduced to the ambassador. Last year, I was serving um, in the State Department as a fellow in the Humanitarian Information Unit, uh, working on a project called MapGive. And we have an email address, which is on the web, and we receive all sorts of random inquiries about our project and about what we do. And one week, uh, we received an email from Ambassador Alan Mustard. And um, I'd only, I was only at the State Department for one year, um, but even in that one year, I realized how unusual and extraordinary um, that in a place which is very concerned with protocol and process, to directly hear from an ambassador about our little project in our little office which of course is very important to all of us, but within a big organization like the State Department and all the embassies around the world, um, we were very much hoping to spread the word on OpenStreetMap to those venues. It was very exciting to hear from the ambassador asking about, I believe, imagery for, for Askabat, for the capital, which had, was very out of date. And this was just, it was just wonderful to have that kind of informal, uh, connection, which I think so exemplifies what OpenStreetMap is about. We just directly get to it and do it. Um, so the ambassador is currently serving as ambassador to Tur Turkmenistan uh, for the United States. He's previously served as distinction as the senior most foreign service officer for the U.S. Department of Agriculture in New Delhi, Mexico City, and Moscow, um, and also serves as an ambassador for OpenStreetMap um, in his current role. So, my pleasure. Please welcome Ambassador Mustard. I'm not known as a juggler, so, but I'm going to be juggling a couple of things here. I have the microphone to juggle, I have my speaker's notes here, and uh, I have this clicker. So, if I drop anything, uh, please forgive me. It's on? It's on. Okay. Uh, that's a little blurry. Can we get that a little bit sharper? No way? Okay, thanks. Um, <laughs> normally, when ambassadors are introduced, you get this lengthy introduction into all the awards they've gotten and the, the magnificent work they've done in various places. And I knew this was going to be a tough audience, so I'm not going to give you any of that kind of nonsense. Um, I'll tell you this. <clears throat> I first started using OpenStreetMap in 2011 as a passive user because I moved to New Delhi. And uh, New Delhi is a city that is very difficult to get around in, and I found that OpenStreetMap was a big help. Uh, two, 2014 rolled around, and I actually began contributing to OpenStreetMap because I was learning enough about New Delhi. I felt confident that I could add information to OpenStreetMap without embarrassing myself. Well, then I got this job, moving to Ashgabat. And um, I took a very deep interest in OpenStreetMap for one major reason, and that is that I am directionally challenged. I'm one of those guys who can get lost uh, literally uh, in his own house sometimes when I've moved to a new place and it's a house. And as I ran around Bosnia uh, about 20 years ago, we didn't have GPSs in those days. We had these maps made out of parachute silk. And this was, this was the state of the map years ago in Europe, parachute silk maps provided by the U.S. military. Uh, we're a little bit better now, uh, but I got to Ashgabat, and after I'd been there about two weeks, my, uh, my secretary came to me in frustration. She said, I got a phone call last night from my daughter. She wanted me to come pick her up. I said, where are you? And my daughter said, I'm in a white building three blocks down from a street corner with a fountain on it. <laughs> that describes approximately 50% of the housing in Ashgabat City. Uh, and she spent two hours looking for her daughter, talking to her on the cell phone until she finally, the daughter said, I see you, I see you, stop, I'll come to you. So I began mapping and uh, enlisted my wife to go with me. We began, uh, and, and we ran into some challenges. One of them was that there are very few street signs in Ashgabat. No telephone book. The last telephone book was published in 1993. 
And we started saying, where do you find the grocery stores? Where do you find pharmacies, hotels, wet markets, hospitals, the other embassies, government offices? But the big impetus was, where are the gas stations? There are only about a dozen and a half gas stations in a city of a million. And I was down to fumes before I found one. And at that point, I said, we have got to do something. And the something, of course, was OpenStreetMap. Now, this was the state of the map when I arrived in January 2015. Uh, there were two maps available on the, on the economy, if you could find them. This one was the Sofitel map done by Sofitel when it was running one of the hotels in Ashgabat. And you notice the streets are labeled with four-digit numbers. This is because when President uh, Niazov was president, he heard from somebody that in the United States, streets are numbered. And he said, that's a great idea. We're going to do the same thing. <laughs> so here you have street 2019. Up here you have street 2033. Down here you have street 2056-3. This was not terribly helpful. Uh, then in 2014, the Ministry of Defense published a tourist map. Don't ask me why. Um, and this had a couple of problems. Uh, this is the same section of town. You can see they have put on the street names, but they have written them in English. So you have Magdamguli Avenue, uh, and you have basically um, pigeonized versions of the names of the streets. So you can take this map and you really have difficulty navigating. Plus, with there are no street signs, how do you find your way around? The other problem with this map is that it was printed in a total of 300 copies in a city of one million. Um, so uh, I started work on OpenStreetMap in Ashgabat, and after I'd been working on it for about a month, month and a half, I had a revelation. I'm the ambassador. These people work for me. <laughs> I can tell them to do things, and they have to do it because I'm the ambassador. And I had a motor pool with drivers who had been driving in Ashgabat for over 20 years. So I went to them, and I said, could you please help contribute to this effort? And they said, sure, we'll be happy to do that, but on one condition. I said, what's that? You have to buy us GPSs so we can navigate too. So I did. Um, now, they went to work helping me with mapping, and we discovered that we had some challenges. And I want to walk you through the five major challenges that we, we faced in Ashgabat. Um, first is that Ashgabat is changing very dramatically and very rapidly. Uh, they're putting $5 billion into an Olympic village uh, that will be used a year from now for the Fifth Asian Indoor and Martial Arts Games. They're putting a billion dollars into renovating existing streets. This is a huge clover leaf that went into operation about six months ago. Enormous amount of concrete being poured for overpasses, clover leaves, traffic circles, 60 kilometers of new streets, uh, expansion of existing streets. Plus, uh, over here I've got this. This is uh, a model of the new expanded airport that was just commissioned on the 17th of this month. $2.3 billion to expand the airport. Um, and I actually used this photograph, by the way. Um, I did a perspective correction on this and used this to draw the new OpenStreetMap version of the airport, if you want to go take a look at it. One of the interesting things about this airport is that this is the new passenger terminal, and this is the president's VIP terminal that he uses. They're both done in the shape of falcons. So if you look at OpenStreetMap and you look down and say, Mustard's crazy, he drew birds on the airport. No, I'm not crazy. That's what's actually there. Um, $5 billion on new housing. Many of the old streets are simply disappearing because they have been bulldozed. The single-family dwellings have been demolished and be replaced with high-rise buildings like this. These are all white marble-faced high-rise buildings. Uh, brand new paved streets, total cost of all of what you see going on in Ashgabat today is a minimum of $14.3 billion being spent over approximately three years. Uh, now, the real bad news is they've got all these new streets and most of them don't have signs. 
because having a street sign on the street side of a building is considered unsightly. So if there is a street sign on a major thoroughfare, it's on the back side of the building. Maybe there is a number on the street side, but, but even that's not guaranteed. And this makes GPSs very, very useful. Now here's some examples if you do find existing street signs. This is challenge number two, signage. Um, up here you have uh, a sign that has a four-digit number on it that's almost legible, 2015 Street, over here 2054 Street. Here's a street that's completely obliterated. They recycled an old street sign, turned it upside down, painted a new name on it, and then you can see the paint kind of came off. We can see the house number over here, 6 slash 2, but you can't see what street it's on. Uh, down here, the homeowner painted over the street sign. Um, and I, I took the photograph anyway, just, just out of curiosity. These four here, with the red line around them, these are street signs on the street I live on. So up here we have Russian written in Cyrillic, Andizhanskaya. Here we have uh, Ulitsa Andizhanskaya, also in Russian with Cyrillic. Here we have Turkmen, Andizhan Kochesi, written in Cyrillic. Here we have Andizhan Kochesi, which is written in Latin letters. And here we have the four-digit number 2054, okay? There's just one problem. That's not the name of the street anymore. <laughs> this street is no longer 2054. It's no longer Andijan. It is now Jalaluddin Rumi, which I found out from the mayor's office when they informed me the name of your street has changed, but they haven't bothered to put any signs up yet. Okay. Now, some people in uh, Ashgabat take matters into their own hands, put up their own street signs. So up here, uh, we have another example. This is nice. Kandi Kazanjikski Prayezd. This is written in Russian, but in Latin letters. So you now have all four variants. Uh, this guy just painted it on his garage door. This guy painted it on the side of his house in letters about two feet high. This guy put it on the roof line of his house, and I missed it driving by. My wife pointed it out, so we had to stop so I could photograph it, because it's, it's sitting up on the roof. It says, this house was built in 1955. Ulitsa Sovetsky Sokolov, this is Soviet Falcon Street. By the way, that's no longer the name of the street either. Uh, it's been changed. It's now Yashul Tug. But you have to be alert, or you can miss the street signs. Now, the other thing, of course, as I mentioned, there's a derussification underway. Uh, the government is removing Russian names and is putting in new names. So, um, Moskovsky Prospect, name for the city of Moscow, is now Onyil Abadanchalik, which means 10 years of prosperity. Sovetskaya is now Independence Avenue, Garashizlik. Uh, um, Sovetskaya, uh, yes, Garashizlik, but there's one problem with this. Nobody has told the taxi drivers. So if you get, you stop a taxi and, and you tell the driver, I need to go to Garage Sizlik number 25, he'll look at you and say, there's no such street. What are you talking about? And you say, no, 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 I need to go to Garage Sizlik, and you show him on the map. Well, he can't read the map, and he just stares at it. So you have to know both streets. And this is where OSM comes in handy, because we can database all these names. They're all in there. You can pull it up. You can tell him, OK. Uh, don't take me to Garashizlik. I've changed my mind. Take me to Sovetskaya. He says, okay, fine. Um, now, another problem we have here with street names is if you look here, oops, let's go back. If you look here, this is Azadi Kochesi, which used to be Ulitsa Engelsa. That's a hard enough problem to know because everybody calls it Ulitsa Engelsa, but it's now Azadi. Azadi was a poet and he had a first name. The first name was Dovlet Mamed. Some of the street signs say Dovlet Mamed Azadi. Others say Azadi. The entry in OSM is Dovlet Mamed Azadi. When that is transferred to your Garmin GPS in your car, you have to know what Azadi's first name was because Garmin GPSs will not search on strings of street names. They will search on the first entry. And this is a problem 
because if we then go to some of the other streets up here, like Abba Anayef, you have to know that Anayef's first name was Abba. Or if you go to Abadanchalik, nobody calls it Onyil Abadanchalik, 10 years of prosperity. We would call it Prosperity Avenue in the United States. You go here and you say, okay, Abadanchalik. If you search on Abadanchalik, you won't find it in your Garmin GPS. You, you have to know that it starts with the number 10. Now, there is some progress. When my wife and I started mapping Ashgabat in uh, about March of 2015, there were a total of about a dozen streets in OSM Ashgabat that had names. We're now up to about 80% at least, maybe close to 90% of the streets have been named. So there is, there is hope. Now, another challenge. You all know the song, A Horse With No Name. Well, in Ashgabat, we have the street with no name. Uh, most of the city is divided into districts, what are called etraps in Turkmen. And each building is numbered uniquely according to what district it's in. But the streets do not have names. So if I want to find this building, I have to know what district it is in. That's a problem, again, with a Garmin GPS, because if you punch in, try to punch in this address, you can't find it. And if anybody out there, if any of you programmers out there have a solution to this problem, I am all ears, um, because learning to navigate with a GPS in a city where the streets don't have names is a real headache. So again, maybe in one of the birds of a feather sessions we can talk about this, or you can come up to me afterwards and tell me how to do this. Challenge number four, imagery just can't keep up. As I said, they're spending $14.3 billion over three years to change the city, and the imagery can't keep up. The uh, uh, Bing imagery is about three, three and a half years out of date. You can see here that this street used to be curved. It is now straight. These buildings are completely gone. Um, you've got new streets that have been punched in. And you say, okay, well, that's fine. Uh, we've got some new imagery. Uh, Mapbox has provided some new imagery, which was a big help. And then the Humanitarian uh, in, uh, Information Unit of the Department of State from the Office of Geographer has provided some even more recent imagery that's been an enormous help. Uh, it's U.S. government licensed, and therefore it's free to use of anybody, and, and uh, I have put up the, the URL for that so that people can find it easily. Uh, and that, that comes, by the way, through the Map Give uh, initiative that was mentioned before. Um, that's been a huge help, but it hasn't solved everything because we have a bunch of newbies in Ashgabat who have discovered OpenStreetMap. They come in, they use the Bing imagery, and they say, oh my goodness, look at this. This guy drew the street straight, and it's supposed to be curved. So they correct my errors except they're not errors. And sometimes I had a little war going on with a young lady who was working for the mayor's office who kept drawing back buildings that had been demolished as part of the city renovation. And this building in particular, if you look at, at this one here, this does not appear in the Bing image you can see over here. I kept redrawing this because she kept tearing it down and rebuilding this building. And we finally, I finally got through to her and said, you have to stop doing this because that building exists. This one no longer does. And uh, here I want to thank the OSM uh, working group, by the way, uh, two people in, in particular, Serge Rotslavsky and, and Frederick Rahm, who were very helpful to me in corralling some of the people who were not really engaged in vandalism as much as they just really didn't know what they were doing. And, they helped me to educate them. Challenge number five, this is the big one, the cultural clash. These are all things that people have communicated to me when I have tried to communicate with them about what they are doing to the map. Um, why are you putting house numbers in the name field of a building, which is specifically discouraged by the OSM guidelines? And the answer I got back was, uh, we need it for ourselves. 
Okay. Um, another guy was changing all of the streets from Kirchesi, which is the Turkmen word for street, to street. And I went back to him and said, you can't do this. And he said, but my GPS pronounces Kirchesi wrong. I want it to say street. And, you know, okay, well, you can't do that, okay? It's, it's, you're not supposed to do that. And why am I being blocked? This was the one after Frederick Ram uh, blocked one person who was really screwing some things up pretty badly. And she came back to me and said, why am I being blocked? And I had to explain to her why she was being blocked. And the bottom line here is that this is really a result of two factors. Uh, first, uh, the Turkmen were nomads until about 100 years ago. And they, they had sheep, flocks that were out on open pasture. They were common pastures. Nobody owned the pastures. It was just the open land in the oasis areas. So the idea of private property is something that is relatively new to the Turkmen mentality. The second thing is that the Turkmen were under Soviet rule for 70 years. And I know there are some folks here who, who come from uh, the eastern side of Europe, and you understand very well what, what that did to people's attitudes towards public property. Um, so under communism, the national government owned and controlled pretty much everything but your personal possessions, and that meant it was possible to appropriate or misappropriate uh, anything that was considered to be more or less a public good. So the idea that a public good comes with rules, that comes with guidelines, that comes with some sort of restrictions on how it can be used is a foreign concept. And this has been a problem trying to get this point across uh, to, to some of the mappers in Turkmenistan. So again, I thank the OSM Working Group for its patience and for its enormous amount of help in, in trying to keep this project alive in Turkmenistan. So all of these headaches, you put them together and it's caused me occasionally to go pour a glass of wine and ask myself one question. Um, why am I doing this? Why am I beating my head against the wall? Is it worth the effort? Why do I take my wife out on evenings and weekends to collect GPS traces and to collect house numbers and things like that? For gosh sakes, I'm an American ambassador. Don't I have better things to do with my time than going out collecting house numbers? So anyway, I, I decided to sit down and make a list of the reasons that it's worthwhile. Payoff number one, it's the best it's the best map of Ashgabat available anywhere. Um, and uh, Igor Breitz has his Map Retief program, which I use absolutely shamelessly and very heavily to produce a street map of, of and this is, this, this is a just, you can see here, this is what the full-sized one looks like. This is an excerpt. Um, the full-sized one is about a meter and a half tall by about, meter and a half to two meters wide, depending on how much of the suburbs I, I include in it. And believe it or not, the motor pool chauffeurs now want a copy in their driver's shack for them to refer to. They have realized the value of having a map of the city that they can use to teach themselves to navigate places they don't know. It includes all the gas stations, hotels, embassies, hospitals, and lots and lots of building numbers. Now, in addition to the general day-to-day -day usefulness of this map, Ashgabat is located in a Category 4 seismic zone. The last earthquake that they had was in 1948. The entire city was leveled, three buildings survived, and approximately half the population was killed. Um, last year, there were MMS 7.5 earthquakes in Iran, Afghanistan, and Tajikistan, just a couple of hundred miles away from Ashgabat. So we're in a seismic zone. The big one could hit at any time and could devastate the city. In the event of a disaster, having a map like this is going to be absolutely invaluable. Um, the second big payoff, it's the only offline GPS map that's available for Turkmenistan. Nobody else has one. Apple, by the way, the Apple map of Turkmenistan is the OSM map. They're using our data. 
uh, maps with me on iPhone and Android, uh, Lambertus's GPS maps downloadable to the Garmin, uh, and of course Pocket Earth on the iPhone. Uh, I use them all. And a big thank you to Lambertus and to the other developers. Uh, you have a real fan club in, in Ashgabat. I have to, have to thank you for that. Um, I think when Apple Maps started using our data, that was big stuff. Payoff 3, the only street atlas is available. You can use field papers or you can use uh, one, of, one of Eager's Mapperative scripts, the walking paper script, to, uh, to generate multi-page street atlases that you can carry with you in your car. And we print these, we have them in our cars in case of emergency. Payoff number four, uh, community outreach. Um, I've done two, two events at our Information Resource Center with local residents, asking them to start contributing street names, uh, building numbers, identifying businesses and other points of interest. The Ashgabat map in the last year has become extremely rich compared to what it was before, basically because we have done this community outreach and have gotten people involved. Um, my two master classes each drew about 40 people. We sat them down, some of them on the spot at, at internet clients and put them to work, and this has been great. We've also presented two Garmin GPSs to the Red Crescent Society for use in their ambulances, and they're testing them. Uh, we also gave them a copy of the wall map. So uh, we're also contributing to the general population of Ashgabat. Um, the Asian Games will be held a year from now and are expected to bring in 8,000 athletes, 1,500 uh, coaches and trainers, and 1,000 journalists. And there's a developer putting together a smartphone app for it. He decided to use the OSM data after comparing the OSM data to Google Maps and realizing that the OSM database is richer than the Google Maps database. And I thought that was a real coup. But the next payoff, the next payoff, payoff number six is the most important one of all. I can find gas stations now. Uh, I can find gas stations, and not just in Ashgabat. Uh, because I have a motor pool, when they drive out into the countryside, go to other cities, they map the gas stations because they've discovered that it's really valuable to know where the gas stations are, especially in a city where you don't live and you don't know it as well. So now, if I run out of gas, it's my own fault. Um, so, in short, yes, it's worth the effort, and that's why I encourage all of you to keep on mapping and to volunteer for Map Give. Pitch in with the humanitarian assistance when disaster strikes and your skills can help those in need. I hope you will engage MapGive's efforts um, through the public affairs section of whatever U.S. Embassy is closest to you and to uh, teach open mapping so that more people can, can, uh, can, can, uh, excuse me, can contribute. And I'll close with this image of a uh, cloverleaf intersection that was commissioned about six months ago and tell you all thank you very much for everything that you do uh, for the mapping community and for the world at large. Thank you.